those of us who are homeschooling in this really big, open, free place have to be aware that the more exposure homeschooling receives, the more resistance is likely to come up and not in a fearful way, but just to be aware that we should be a good example as homeschool families so that people's experiences with us are good and they want to be our advocate and they're interested in what we're doing. We just need to think about how can I represent homeschooling well and steward the freedom that I've been given. Welcome to Homeschool Talks, a podcast by HSLDA. This is a show about all things homeschooling, from practical tips to inspiring stories and everything in between. You can find show notes for this episode along with our other Homeschool Talks conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoyed the program. Here's your host, Jim Mason. Hi, I'm Jim Mason, president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and I welcome you here to another version of Homeschool Talks, where I get to talk to interesting people uh, in the homeschooling world and, and the interesting things that they're doing, and I'm very excited today to welcome Felicia Masonheimer. Uh, Felicia is the founder and CEO of a um, raft of things that go under the, the title, Every Woman a Theologian. She's got a podcast, she writes books and uh, speaks and has a blog and all sorts of things. In, in her spare time, she homeschools her three children. Uh, welcome, Felicia. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, it looks like you do have an awful lot of things you're doing, but let's start with your homeschooling journey. When did your personal homeschooling journey begin? Well, my personal homeschooling journey began when I was in first grade, when my parents pulled me out of Christian school to do an experiment for one year mm. of keeping me home. And last year, my mom finished 26 years of homeschooling. So she never actually stopped after that year. Is that, <laughs> so, is, is, has she been homeschooling you that whole time? Well, oh, that's a good question. The whole time, 26 years. I guess you could say in theory, I'm still learning from her. So <laughs> um, she homeschooled six children. I was the oldest of those six. And mm. um, I was homeschooled from first grade through high school graduation. And then I went on to work in higher education as a homeschool college advisor, specializing in helping homeschool families prepare their children to go to college. And then shortly after working in that field for about five years, I went into ministry and now do what I do today. So I have a long, um, a long history of of being, you know, in the homeschool world. I'm passionate about it. My husband is also a homeschool graduate, and now we're homeschooling our three kids. So we love homeschooling around here. <laughs> so, um, in addition to your love of homeschooling, you have three children that you're homeschooling, and I guess you're also homeschooling three goats. Yes, you could call those my my extra kids. My <laughs> husband would would like if they, you know, kind of left the homestead. He's not a big fan of goats, but he's let me keep them so far, and I do love them very much. <laughs> so you live up in northern Michigan. Yes, and, that's and right. Is that where you're from? Have you always lived up there? Um, yes, I was born in northern Michigan, but my husband and I have lived in Virginia, which is where I mainly worked in higher education for homeschool families. And we've also lived in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and I've lived in New Mexico, but we moved back to Michigan after we had our first daughter. And um, how did you get into the ministry area that you're currently in? Yeah, so it's a little bit of a winding road, so I won't in get into the entire story. But oh, we, love, we love we love long winding road stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Okay, so I was 16 years old. I I was starting out as a blogger. So at this time, this would have been about 2006, and blogging was just coming on the scene. It was kind of a, a really big thing at that time for teenagers. And so I started blogging around that time. And what I really enjoyed doing was just breaking down what I was learning in the Bible mm. and kind of writing out what 
what I gleaned from scripture. I had become a Christian not much before that at about 15 years old. And I really enjoyed breaking down scripture for my own benefit on my blog. I'd like to write. And so I continued to do that into my early twenties on this blog, this website and, um, found it fascinating, but I had this career as a an advisor to homeschool families in private and public school families too. And so I did not see it as something that I was necessarily called to do. I, I was quite happy and passionate about both higher education and home education and did not foresee myself doing anything else. But my blog over the years had gained traction. And because I was working for a university, I decided, well, I can just get whatever degree I want at the university because I have a career here. So I don't, it doesn't really matter what mm-hmm. I get a degree in. So I'll do what I like. And I like religion and biblical studies. So I got a four-year degree in religion and I ended up using that to continue to write on my blog and on my website and began to gain some traction and gain some interest as I was doing that. And it kind of grew into this, people call it a side hustle, but it was a ministry. And I really just sought to bless mostly single women, um, young women in their 20s and in their teens to help them understand what the Bible said and how it applies to real life. And so as time went on, I met my husband, we got married, um, we had children. Um, the Lord just continued to open doors in ministry and kind of change our hearts and change my calling. I left working in higher education, college advising, and ended up doing the ministry eventually full-time. And it goes under the title, Every Woman a Theologian. How did you arrive at that and what's the significance of it? Well, originally when we started out, I was writing a lot about relationships. How do we do biblical relationships? How do we t- think about Christian sexuality? That was a big question a lot of a lot of my peers were asking, and so I was wrestling with those ideas on on my blog. But then I began to think, you know, we can't talk about relationships and sexuality without actually stepping back and asking why does God get to tell me how to live in the first place, which is a very theological question. So I started expanding to write more about, you know, who is God? Why can I trust him? How come the Bible is trustworthy? How do we know this is true? So more apologetics and theology material. And as it expanded and broadened, I realized, you know, putting this blog under my name only isn't really what I want for the future. I want it to be something that can be more expansive than that. And so our team and I came up with the name Every Woman a Theologian because our vision is for every Christian to take ownership of their faith, to to wrestle with these ideas for themselves, and to take seriously the call of discipleship, to be a theologian, um, maybe not professionally or academically, but at least personally. Who's your um, target audience? Our primary audience is women, and our primary reader base is between the ages of 15 and 40, but we reach men and women of all ages. We have readers who are 75 and 85. We have teenage readers. We have pastors who follow our work and my work, and it's a huge honor to get to serve the global church in all of its ages and stages. So what do you think the biggest kind of issues are from your perspective uh, for homeschooling parents these days? I think I think that there are a variety that we could pinpoint. Um, and it does depend on where you live and the culture of your city, your state, your country. I think that definitely dictates some of the the issues that you would face more than others. Um, as a second generation homeschooler, I see a couple things. One is that I see that homeschool parents are tasked with equipping their children to think very critically about the things that are going on in our culture. Mm -hmm. But the challenge of that is to think critically without having a critical and fearful spirit. What I've found in having spent so much time in the world of homeschooling is that it can be very easy to fall into a fearful rather than confident mindset. And theologically, I think that that's something we as homeschool parents need to be very conscious of 
because scripture tells us that we've not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And so we should be teaching our kids to think critically about issues of sexuality and government, politics, um, you know, media, thinking critically through these things, but not from a fearful standpoint, from a standpoint of gracious confidence. Hmm. So that's one issue. What else? Um, I think, uh, am, I, am I correct in thinking that you are in the millennial generation? Yes, correct. And do you think that there's much, do you put much stock in those generational divisions? I'm a boomer. So boomer, okay, that's me. And uh, I have, I have uh, some Gen Xer kids, some millennial kids, and I might even have a Gen Z kid. Any, any uh, relevance to that from your perspective? Well, I think you have more experience with it than me, so I'd be <laughs> curious about your perspective. But I, I think that it can be a very self-fulfilling prophecy in a way where if you say there's division, you see the division. But at, at the same time, I do think there are some significant differences between how millennials as a generation operate and see the world and how Gen Z specifically um, operates and sees the world. I'm 14 years older than my youngest sibling and she is Gen Z. So, you know, there are differences that I observe even within my own family and how we the priorities we have, the way we communicate, the way we, we see the world. Um, millennials, I have found, tend to be very perfectionistic. So they tend to want this I, idyllic, almost aesthetic lifestyle um, and social media, which is what I work in. I see a lot of um, homeschooling accounts that actually present things almost in an unrealistic manner, you know, just almost like a uh, too beautiful to be real. And homeschooling is beautiful. But I do think that um, millennials, one of our challenges, especially as homeschool parents, is to um, remember that the mission is more important than anything else to keep Christ first in that mission and to not be distracted by things not looking the way that we dreamed or expected all the time. I'm sure there's different challenges for Gen Z and for Gen X. Um, my parents are are actually Gen X, and um, I think there's just different ways we see the world, and we need to have grace for yeah. those differences. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, wisdom in not putting too much stock in those kind of labels, and and in a lot of ways, that's why my wife and I chose to homeschool, so that uh, you know some of the things that I've seen that you've written, um, the homeschool lifestyle, sort of doesn't. Um, kind of pigeonhole children into, you know, age specific kind of uh, categories. And, and I know you've written about that. What are, what are some of the advantages of homeschooling uh, from your perspective in, in these challenging times? We do, I mean, I, I mm -hmm. probably could say this any time during my lifetime, but what, what uh, are the advantages in these challenging times? I think homeschooling provides so many advantages. I don't think that I could do what I do today if I was not home educated because I was given the gift and I think homeschooling gives this gift, the gift of thinking freely. And I'm not saying a kid who's in public school can't think freely, but I think they have to overcome a lot more to do it because you are given the pressure of peers, whether that's positive or negative, it is a group pressure that is going to make it difficult to think outside of the box because there's an extremely high cost to doing so. But in home education, you're encouraged to think outside of the box all the time, at least in healthy homeschool cultures. And so I was given an education where I could constantly question, and I was a questioning kid, which is what I deal in, all I deal in all day long is theological questions, people's questions, my own questions. And so my entire ministry is really the fruit of being able to ask extremely hard questions and wrestle out the answers. I wasn't on this tight timeline of classes where I had to get the next thing done. So there weren't time for my questions. So it's both freedom to ask and think, critically think, but also a freedom of schedule and a freedom of customizing the educational approach. My parents customized their education to every single child. 
I, in particular, was given a more classical education, but my siblings were not. And when I asked my parents about that, I said, why did I take Latin and logic and rhetoric and my sister didn't? They said, because we knew that you could use it. And I do. I use it every day. But my sister is an artist. She's a phenomenal musician and artist and leather worker and metal worker. She didn't really need Latin. She was, she was doing other things. And so they were able to customize our education to the skill sets and the giftings that they saw when we were young. And that actually paved the way for me to do what I do today. I read one of your articles, Five Ways Homeschooling Equips Students for Life. What are those five ways and why are they important? Oh, you know what, Jim? I'm going to hold you to it. A, I'm counting. I'm that's counting. an old article. <laughs> <laughs> that's from a, I'm not going to say the five in the accurate way, but I can take a... <laughs> well, give us three and a I half. I can take a guess. Give us three and a half ways that homeschooling equips students for life. <laughs> well, I think the first one is for sure, again, that f the the ability to think critically and freely. You know, we talk about critical thinking, but what, is, what does that mean? I, when I say thinking freely, I mean that you can think about something from any angle. You can even think badly about something, maybe, or, or come to a poor conclusion, but it's okay to do that in that space. And because you're free to do that, you actually grow stronger in your ability to critically think. You can challenge different perspectives and look at different angles of a topic. Some people might call it being the devil's advocate, but one of the things we do at Every Woman a Theologian is we present multiple denominational perspectives. So we'll look at the perspective of you know, uh, a Protestant Reformed Christian. We'll look at the perspective of a Protestant Arminian Christian. We'll look at the Catholic perspective. We'll look at the Orthodox perspective. And so what we're doing is we're, we're, we're looking at all angles. And that's something that homeschooling gives is the ability to wrestle something out and look at those angles. That's one. Two would be the freedom to, to work and multiple contexts to build out a resume extremely young. Um, I started working as a mother's helper when I was about 12. I got my first job outside the house when I was 15. Um, and then I had a series of jobs all the way through. I mean, tons of them, all helping me learn life skills that I would need to get to the next step in my career. And it wasn't linear, but I was able to start super young because of the flexibility of my, my education. So I was learning at work, and learning at home, flexibility allowed me to, to have more job opportunities. And the third one, I would probably say um, for Christian homeschoolers is the spiritual formation that you receive because you're being discipled at home with your parents and in a very intentional way where you're equipping your kids with this strong foundation where they they have a foundation in scripture, hopefully from the elementary years. In the classical education philosophy, you know you have the, the, the beginning stages, the grammar stages is, or when you're just learning the concepts and then you're going to the next level where you're connecting concepts and defining terms. And then in the final stage, high school, that's when you would be debating terms and debating concepts. And so I think that any homeschool philosophy, even if it's not classical, has little echoes of this in it where you're laying the foundation. And then as they grow, they should be able to leave the home equipped spiritually to go out into the world instead of sending them as quote unquote missionaries into the school when they really don't even have a foundation yet, you take 18 years to give them the foundation and then you send them out. What about exposure to multiple generations for homeschoolers? Um, you know, kids who go to tr traditional school like I did when I was growing up, um, kind of stuck with the same cohort, you know, from first grade through 12th. Uh, homeschoolers don't do that. Is that a, uh, you know, a negative or a positive? I think it's an advantage because you are familiar with a wide range of walks of life. It's diversity of age, which actually in today's culture, we found to be a challenge even in the modern church. And I, to be perfectly honest, I actually credit that difficulty to the American educational system. The reason we're having a problem with um, diversity and inclusion in the church when it comes to age is because for their entire educational experience, they're divided by age. So you can't expect once you get out of 18 years of high, you know, school and then college, and then you pop out into the Christian church as a young working adult, it's really hard to 
deprogram that segregation. And so when I'm looking at the culture of the church in America, which is what I'm often addressing, when we see ageism, it's often pointing back to how we have trained this separation into Americans. We've trained them to be in their grade. So then when you try to put together a, a Bible study or a small group, well, we divide by age or by life stage. And in homeschooling, we get to experience all ages and stages all together all the time. So it's much more natural for us to be inclusive of different ages and walks of life because we're accustomed to that variety. Well, tell me, uh, what's a day in the life of Felicia Masonheimer and Josh Masonheimer, three children and three goats? What's it like for you guys? <laughs> Well, I do show on Instagram once a week, I, I do show a day in the life um, for this reason to kind of show like, what does it look like to um, run a ministry together? My husband and I work together at the ministry um, and lead a team of about eight employees and then homeschooling. So the way that we do things right now is we split the day in half. My husband works in the morning, either shipping out packages. We have a wide, about 34 published um, books in our shop. We ship those out from our warehouse on site. And then I homeschool in the morning. So once we've done chores, we fed the animals, um, we clean the house a little bit, we sit down and we do school from about nine in the morning to noon. Um, and then my husband comes in for lunch and then we switch. And so in the afternoons, I take meetings like this one. I write books and Bible studies. I meet with our team members, um, go over edits and decisions we have to make for the company. Um, and then in the evenings, we try to really dedicate those to family time and to hosting people, spending time with friends, um, doing games with the kids, things like that. It sounds kind of idyllic. Um, how did, how did the, the COVID times affect you and your life and your ministry? COVID was a significant transition for us. Um, up to that point, my husband was the primary breadwinner. He was working as an operations manager and I was home writing on the side. So I had several book contracts I was completing and then I was blogging and creating content for our website, our ebook library. But it was not enough to live on at the time. It was it was enough to, you know, save some money, but nothing substantial enough that our family could survive on it. But during 2020, during COVID, I was also pregnant with our third child. And um, we just went through some really traumatic financial and work-related things as a family. And we prayed about what to do. And, and we believe that the Lord led us um, to have my husband resign from his position and come home. And we thought at the time that you know, he would take over homeschooling for a little bit and I would work on writing to try to, to create a product that would help support us for a few months through the pregnancy. And he was fully prepared to work part-time somewhere. My husband's a very humble man. He would have worked anywhere um, to make up the difference, but he never had to. The Lord provided for us and has expanded the ministry to the point that um, now we have eight employees in the three years three and a half years since he came home. So that's a huge blessing for us. And we're super, super grateful, even though it was a, a very stressful time. So we're we're recording this on the last day of February, the day that only exists once every four years. Um, and a lot of homeschooling parents, maybe moms especially, this time of year in the doldrums of the winter time could use a shot of encouragement. How would you encourage all of those homeschool moms out there who are kind of midway in the dead of winter through their homeschooling year? <laughs> <laughs> it is so hard. I saw a post recently that said, you're not depressed, it's just February <laughs> <laughs> for homeschool parents. And I thought that's true. Um, when I have a hard homeschool day or week or month, um, and it is hard sometimes, you know, we're juggling a lot right now. Our kids are very young. We want to make sure they're educated well, um, but there's a lot to do. I just think back to my own homeschool education, and I'm sure I know for a fact that my mom felt that same way. Like these kids are not learning anything or <laughs> they are not paying attention um, or they're not finishing the work that they need to in time. And when I think back to that moment my mom probably had, and then I look forward to where I am now, 
I feel very encouraged that what is being done in those seemingly, you know, difficult, maybe mundane days is actually going to bear fruit when you are consistent day after day to continue to offer your children the gift of a customized, grounded education. Because we don't always see the fruit right away. You don't see the fruit right away, which I know you know better than anyone, Jim, (laughs) having raised kids, more kids than me. Um, You don't see the fruit right away, but I'm living evidence of the fruit and the fact that I could not do what I do today if I had not been given the gift of the education that I had. And so that encourages me, and I hope it encourages some people who are listening. Um, so my producer gave me this quote to ask you about, and I don't know if you if she provided it to you too, but I'm going to read it, and uh, I'd like you to talk about it. There are no patient people. There are just called people. That's it. Sorry. That's are, it. I, yeah, I, I didn't read it very well. There are no patient people. There are just called people in in the homeschooling context. What do you mean by that? One of the things that people often say to homeschool parents is, well, I could never do that. I'm not patient enough. And it's a frustrating thing for homeschool parents to hear because it's actually quite dismissive. It, it says that patience is something inherent, that you're born with it, and that is really dismissive of how much work it is for homeschool parents to show up every day. Patience is a discipline. It's a fruit of the spirit. It's something that we have worked in us by doing hard work over and over, by being willing to sacrifice and lay ourselves down. Patience is a muscle. It grows as it is used. And so the reason I say there's no patient people, but there's called people is that when you know that you are called to do something by God, you know he will give you the strength of his spirit to do that work. So you become patient by disciplining yourself or letting the Lord discipline you into your calling. And so rather than, you know, I think people mean well, but rather than being dismissive and saying, oh, I'm just not patient, the question is, well, maybe you're not called. And if you were called to it, you would become patient. Um, Or maybe they're resisting that calling because they think they need to be patient first. But patience is never learned first. It's learned in process. And I think that applies far beyond homeschooling. Well, I'm really glad I asked you that question because I, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. If that's okay with you. Absolutely. I, 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 I need I need something good for one of my speeches. Um, when we um, when we think of the homeschooling um, movement, you know, back in the late '70s, there were maybe three homeschooling families in the whole world, and now there's millions of kids in America being homeschooled. Um, what do you see for the future of the homeschooling movement? I think about this often. Um, I'm in Michigan. Michigan is currently undergoing um, a lot of concerns about legislation um, that we're facing. Um, we've been a very free state for homeschooling for the longest time. Now there's a bill that's that's being broached right now in our house regarding registration of homeschoolers. We're very grateful for HSLDA mm. in moments like this. Um, So when I think about the future, I think it's a little bit like John Adams, one of the founding fathers, just one of one of my heroes. And he often said, you know, I am I am fighting for these freedoms so that my children can study freely. And that's a little bit, I'm paraphrasing, but that's a little bit like what happened with the homeschoolers in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s was, you know, they had to be pretty bold characters. Some of them went to jail in order to lay the foundation for us to study freely. And John Adams said, you know, I basically study politics and war so that my children can study art and music. That's kind of the same thing. We're at the stage now where I am the child studying art and music, but we can't forget how hard fought that privilege was. And that means that going forward, those of us who are homeschooling in this really big, open, free place have to be aware that the more exposure homeschooling receives, the more legislation is likely to come up, the more resistance is likely to come up, and not in a fearful way, but just to be aware 
that we should be praying for the protection of that freedom. We should be a good example as homeschool families, a good witness to both the Lord, but also homeschooling in general. How can we be, how can we represent homeschooling well so that people's experiences with us are good and they want to be our advocate and they're interested in what we're doing? That's something that I think for my generation of homeschoolers and the generation after me, we just need to think about how can I represent homeschooling well and steward the freedom that I've been given? Yeah, I think complacency is probably always a, a, a risk. Uh, the the more free we are, the easier it is to kind of take it for granted and to forget that there were actual. I um, mean, Michigan, my my goodness, I I wrote my uh, law review article in law school about the Michigan homeschool freedom wars that occurred in the uh, 80s and 90s, and. Uh, you know, so since that time, Michigan has been a really great uh, and free place, and homeschooling has prospered. But as you mentioned today, we're we're facing some some uh, retrenchment, and we can't be complacent. So, I'm glad you're up there in Michigan, and you're aware and active, and uh, and helping uh, to preserve the freedom up there as well. Well, listen, how can people find you and your materials? They can go to FeliciaMasonheimer.com. It's a mouthful, but I'm pretty sure I'm the only Felicia Masonheimer possibly in the world, <laughs> spelled the way it's spelled. So um, it will come right up. And that is where all of our books, resources, courses, free classes, things like that are all located on that website. And you can also follow us on social media, Felicia Masonheimer on Facebook and Instagram, or Every Woman a Theologian. Either way, um, you'll find our resources. And we'll make sure and put those links in our show notes. So once this is released, you'll be able to uh, just scroll down and find them. I've been through uh, a bunch of uh, Felicia's materials, and I think they're delightful and challenging, and you will be greatly blessed by checking them out. Felicia, I'm going to give you the last word. I would just say I am so grateful to the privileges that homeschooling has provided me. I'm grateful to the protections that HSLDA has provided. And I hope that my kids get to benefit in the same way that I did and stand on the foundation that was given to me. Well, those are some really good um, last words. Uh, I want to thank you again for joining us and for all the good work you're doing with your three kids and those three goats. And I did, I did fail to mention, I did want to mention that uh, Josh is a man after my own hearts. He loves hockey and Legos, right? Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> That's we have we have a whole basement full of Legos at our house. Um, I, I might be having a Lego sale someday soon. Well, let us know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and for those of you who who really are interested in Legos, I did a uh, podcast podcast interview of a couple of guys who won like the Lego thing on TV. I can't remember their names now, but check it out. It was cool. They were exciting uh, homeschooled kids who won the Lego Master Builders. Yeah, it was fun. So thank you again, uh, Felicia, for joining us today. And again, I'm Jim Mason. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our other episodes and uh, share this with your friends. If you'd like to get upcoming podcast episodes delivered right to your inbox, you can sign up for Homeschool Talks email list. Um, you'll receive exclusive content and you'll be able to even submit questions that I'll try to, do I mean, that I'll answer on a future <laughs> podcast. Um, and if you're not yet a member of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, we'd love to have you join us. As Felicia mentioned, homeschool freedom is not to be taken for granted. And our job here at HSLDA is to keep homeschooling free for you and future generations. So go to homeschooltalks.com slash join to join with us to find out what's going on around the country, including up in Michigan. Um, so once again, I'm Jim Mason, president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and this has been an episode of Homeschool Talks. Thanks for joining us. Every week, HSLDA hears from hundreds of homeschool families, many of whom are facing hostility from school officials or discrimination from colleges and employers. We've helped single parents facing criminal charges for homeschooling their children families traumatized by wrongful CPS investigations, and even a grandmother harassed by the state for homeschooling her granddaughter. By donating to HSLDA, 
you can help make homeschooling possible for families like these and enable our work to preserve freedom for future generations. Give today at hslda.org forward slash donate. That's hslda.org forward slash donate. Thanks for listening to this episode of Homeschool Talks. If you've enjoyed this conversation, will you do us a favor by sharing it with a friend or leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts? As a reminder, you can find show notes for this episode along with our other Homeschool Talks conversations at hslda.org forward slash podcast. And if you want to be the first to know about new episodes, as well as upcoming guests and topics, you can sign up for our email list using the link in the show notes. That's all for now. We hope you enjoyed this program and we'll see you next time.